This podcast is part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. Go to BigHeadsMedia.com for more great podcasts. Thank you for calling Cooking with Grief, the comedy podcast that explores the wonderful worlds of art, science and history. Your call is very important to us. Please stay on the line. For the theme music, press 1. For a characteristically self-deprecating host introduction, press 2. Hello, I'm Chris with a body like a lynch circus bear left to rot in the woods, and the voice of a goat kicked down three flights of stairs. To introduce a co-host, please press 3. And joining me as ever on this mulk of knowledge, it's Chris. Hello. To engage in small talk, please press 4. How are you, Chris? I'm well, thank you. How are you? I'm alright, given the circumstances. The circumstances being that you're now a telephone message. Look, automation is coming for us all. <laughs> if I can head him off at the pass. <laughs> yeah, well, that sound logic. Be all right. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, no, I'm doing well. We're uh, still existing, which is what you can hope for. Well, I mean, it's not. But... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all you can expect at the minute. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, expectations, not hopes. Hmm. For a brief description of how the podcast works, press 5. Each episode, myself and Tother Chris bring two topics of core uh, interest, and we share them with each other, and thereby you. To start Chris's first topic, please press six. So, let me ask you a question. Do you believe in Germany? <laughs> in Germany? In Germany. That it exists, or am I, like, rooting for them? The former. Well, unless it's an elaborate prank, I'm pretty sure I've been there. So I'm going to go with, yes, I believe in Germany existing as a place. Okay, well... Are you about to tell me I'm wrong? Well, no, I think you're right, and I think the vast majority of people would think you're right. But there is a movement within Germany that doesn't believe that Germany exists. The final doctrine of the party was to refute the evidence of your own eyes and ears, I guess. (laughs) <laughs> nice 1984 shower there. So, there's a man called Peter Fitzek. He's the self styled king of Germany, but he doesn't believe that Germany itself exists in a, a sort of legal sense. I mean, he obviously agrees that, like, there's bits of grass and stuff. Like, it doesn't mean there's just, like, a void in the middle of your. It's not like a sort of texture but, that hasn't loaded in properly. Yeah, exactly. He does believe, uh, well, I mean, I assume to please a German. I think he's a billionaire. A millionaire. He's a leader of a cult because, you know, why not? <laughs> if I was rich, I'd probably start a cult for shits and gigs. But he essentially believes that Germany has no constitution and no legitimate authority. And he seems to basically think that since. Because he was born. He grew up in East Germany. But he reckons that because Nazi Germany never really dissolved, it just sort of. I don't know why. It seems like an oddly arbitrary point. Like. Because Nazi Germany never dissolved, then you know the modern, what is it, Bun- is it called Bundesrepublik or something mm-hmm. like that? You know the modern German Republic doesn't have any authority. So he's carved out for himself a patch of land in Germany, declared it Königreich. It's nine hectares, and apparently he's got uh, about three thousand people living there. And he's declared himself king. Right, so Königreich is what kingdom? Yes, I, I don't know. <laughs> you may, you phrase it like a question, but you speak German and I don't. Okay, keep talking. I'm just going to reach my German dictionary. Apparently, it was previously called Neu Deutschland, which I'm pretty sure means New yep, Germany. Lovely. In his little kingdom, he has a state-run healthcare scheme, but I don't actually know how that works. It doesn't elaborate on details, but I assume it's just hands out paracetamol or something. I was right. Uh, uh, das Königreich okay. is uh, a kingdom. Okay. Thank you, Susie Dent, of the dictionary <laughs> corner there. <laughs> uh, it's got his own currency called the Engelgeld. He uh, apparently calls it 
he has a coat of arms. <laughs> and the only problem is it is a bit, well, um, I don't know. He calls it the Fourth Reich, which is... Mm, on, bad marketing. Yeah, it's a bit Nazi-ish. Mm. Um, I don't know what is... It doesn't elaborate on his personal beliefs, so I, I don't want to speculate. But um, the fact that he seems to claim descendants from the fact that the Third Reich didn't dissolve. There's some sketchy dealings here before we just declare it a um, whimsical. Yeah, because it, it, it sounds like a tax dodge more than anything. Like, Oh yeah, so he uh, he has been arrested for fraud. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> that, was, that, that was what I was going to get around to, is that it's, it sounded like he wanted to like declare sovereignty, and then the German government went, no. <laughs> it's, Ger- it's Germany. Because it, it reminded me, like you've spoken before about like wars that have never officially ended. And, you know, that sort of technicality mm-hmm. of, like, is it Beric that's still technically at war or was still technically at war because yeah. it never got, you know, officially... Yeah, it was mentioned in the declare in the declaration of war, but not in the declaration of... <laughs> of peace. Of peace, yeah. however. And then it also reminded me of, you know, like, off the coast of Britain, there were, like, people who take... who, like... If there were, like, abandoned oil rigs and stuff... And they they sort mm-hmm. of oh yeah one they of sort those. of move in and then go we are the republic of you know yeah oh, I can't remember the name it, there is one on an oil rig in the like North Dave sea, Town or I something think. yeah I can't remember what it's called now but, yeah like that that's one it, thing to do it like offshore but another just a big big hunk of land <laughs> in the middle of what everyone agrees to be Germany and then just go like you know like oh yeah. right no no oh. we're our own thing now and they're going. No, you can pay your taxes. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Well, that's it. And then, because he's got all these people that he says live rent free on his kingdom, but then he also issues their currency. So, which presumably he then transfers into dollar into euros, so that he can buy stuff. Um, he, but he's even made their own. Uh, so he's been arrested previously because he also issued their own driving licenses and stuff. And then he drove around. Apparently, he deliberately was driving over the speed limit because he wanted to be taken to court to prove that he had authority to issue his own driving licenses. And they just said no. <laughs> That's a, ha- a hard and also- nine. <laughs> <laughs> and then also, like like you say, sounds like tax dodging and stuff. Yeah, he's also been sentenced to uh, embezzlement, uh, prison for embezzlement because, again, everyone deposits their money into his... Uh, He's made his own central bank, and then that's you know to exchange for his Engel Guild. Yeah, it, so- it sounds like money laundering because then he could arbitrarily. Yeah. It's not floated on the stock exchange, is it? So we can just be like, "Oh no, sorry, lads, you don't get many uh, Engel yeah. Guild to the mark." Not the mark. <laughs> what year is it? <laughs> to the, to, to the <laughs> yeah. euro these days. This is his own little kingdom, but there is a wider movement of people who just don't believe that Germany exists as a legal entity. They're but, German people living in Germany. Yeah. So he claims not to be part of this movement, but is essentially like the same. He has the same uh, beliefs. But like, if you were to do a Venn diagram, apparently, of like people who believe that the you know modern Republic of Germany has no legitimacy and people who believe the Nazis definitely, definitely did... There is apparently quite a lot to cross over. Hmm. The thing with these things, when you try and talk about whether or not something's legitimate, it's always a bit, like, arbitrary. Like, at what point did something become legitimate? You know, because considering most countries are basically made of, like, one smaller... There used to be a bunch of small kingdoms that spoke similar-ish languages, and then one of them invaded the rest and took over. Yeah. Maybe married some of them. Like, maybe married the princess of one kingdom. Yeah. Like... You know, like so, it's just rule through sort of unification. Yeah, it just seems arbitrary. Yeah, yeah. it's like well, we've got like England and Scotland and stuff, and it's like ah, Scotland's its own nation, and it's like, well, yeah, it's part of the UK because England basically invaded it a shitload of times, and then eventually they kept into marrying and stuff until they were like, right, well, we've got one one royal family now, we're one country. Yeah. At the same time, that's exactly what happened like a thousand years before making England in the first place was a bunch of like smaller kingdoms invading. You know, like at which point do you say, right, everything before then wasn't legitimate and everything after then is legitimate. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think and what like, like an equivalent movement for the UK would be that, I don't know, they don't recognise the authority of anything like once the Romans left. 
no, yeah. like, oh, well, they never never formalized all the paperwork or papyrus work. I was just going to say, our thing's just weird, though, in, like, the four home nations, and obviously Northern Ireland and has its own sort of take on the issue. Like, that's the most contested, isn't mm-hmm. it? But then, like, you got a weird thing where, like, Wales technically isn't as, like, you know, like, whenever they release stats for things, it's always, like, the stats for Northern Ireland, the stats for Scotland, and then the stats for England and mm-hmm. Wales. Because Wales, for some reason, is like a principality rather than its own. You know, and it all stems back to, two, you know, one and a half thousand years ago when somebody invaded somewhere and did something. You know, and it's like, it seems a bit weird that like we're still using that as like the definition. Yeah, but it, it also seems stupid to draw an arbitrary line under it now to, to say like, Hmm. Well, it, you know, it wasn't formalised then, so I don't accept it now. And it's like, mm-hmm. you know, just get on board, pay your taxes. Pay that, Wales. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking more about this this uh, German billionaire. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, well, that's it. It does seem, like you say, more to do with embezzlement. There were some guys in Australia who, again, got done for tax fraud, but they uh, they just dug a moat around their house and then declared it independent <laughs> and refused to pay taxes. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, like, on this podcast before, we have spoken several times about starting our own city, if not country, mm-hmm. inevitably naming yeah. it after ourselves. So I get the allure, <laughs> but I wouldn't do that now and just declare that, oh, my house, I do not recognise the, the the sovereignty of the British uh, government. I do you not remember when uh, there was a TV show? You know, Danny Wallace. Oh, uh, um, ha- ha- how to and... start your own country. And he started his own country in his flat, yeah. <laughs> semi-legal status or something. He also tried a, a one-man invasion of, is it Jersey? No, somebody actually did that. Um, I think it was Sark. Oh, yeah, 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 I got confused. I know we did did try and invade somewhere. No, yeah, so in Sark, somebody actually did lead a one-man invade, like, literally, because it's like a small island with, like, a tiny population, and literally one guy in a gun turned up. And try to invade it. Uh, I think he he also stopped for lunch on a park bench, if I remember Probably. correctly. Oh yeah, I should also point out that, um, and I should have done this at the top, that this topic was brought to my attention by our friends' podcast on Germany, uh, who you can find at Twitter on underscore Germany. Thank you, Shane. Which is a history of Germany podcast. They've not got up to uh, this particular point in time yet and so they could, uh, <laughs> whether or not this this disproves the entire purpose of the whole podcast so they could either give it to us or wait till season 480 yeah. to get to the modern day yeah exactly so uh yeah thank you to them and that's it from me okay great and so over to you chris for your first topic Okay, so for my first topic, I'll start off with a question. Chris, have you got any anxieties about public speaking? I try to avoid it. I mean, like, I can speak in public, as in I can speak in front of people. (laughs) But, like, yeah. You can talk to, like, bar staff. Yeah. But the idea of standing up on a stage and having to talk to people or talk at people um, would not be my comfort zone. No, and I'm guessing that even further outside your comfort zone would be public singing. Oh, literally never. Yeah, you never done <laughs> you never done karaoke. Nope. No, no intentions to. Rather not. No intentions. No, I can't I sing. I don't want to. No, just no, no. No, I don't even. Yeah, I'd sweats just thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> I've done karaoke a few times, and it's a pretty awful experience every time. And like. I've got like a couple of songs I can sing. Okay, they're they're like the right key for me. Mm-hmm. You know, used to be in a band, but the sort of band where it doesn't, no one's really listening for the quality of the singing. But yeah, the idea of doing it publicly is is pretty awful. But I've got a story about one of my musical heroes, Aretha Franklin, who obviously ha- had no qualms with <laughs> public singing. Um, mm-hmm. But at the 1998 Grammy Awards. Um, Pavarotti was set to sing Nessun Doma as part of the uh, ceremony. And mm. 20 minutes before he was meant to go on stage, he claimed he was too ill and backed out. Which is, oh. you know, like with 20 minutes to go, you think, just do it, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be a lot of work for someone. 
Um, so with 20 minutes notice, uh, Aretha Franklin, who was like already there to perform something else, said, oh, I can do it. <laughs> it's like one of the most iconic sort of songs in opera. Mm-hmm. Um, so she uh, listened to... So Pavarotti, Pavarotti had already done a rehearsal. So she listened to the recording uh, of that once on a cassette player and then yeah. said, yeah, I've, I've got that. And then said she could do it. So she, she rehearsed a little bit with just the uh, conductor, but with no backing music, just to sort of run through it once. So the first time she'd sung it sort of properly was when she stepped on stage uh, with yeah. a choir of 30 people and a 50 plus orchestra and then knocked it out the park. And it's oh, like, it. oh yeah, like... Isn't it like in Italian? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if Aretha Franklin speaks Italian, but I don't, I don't think mean she doesn't. I didn't think she did. But then that's like quite good just to like, even just to get the words Yeah, just to right, get it. Right, without just going, Eh, mamma mia, <laughs> ciao bella, <laughs> cornetto, <laughs> frutti tutti. I don't know, it's not particularly in Italian. <laughs> But yeah, it's like you know Can you mean? imagine how awful that would have been if she just sang sort of stock phrases Spaghetti a la carbonara You know, that'd be awful exactly. even if she did it. But so to go go from like not knowing the words to like learning that and the music. I mean it's a you know, super famous piece, so maybe she knew it already but even so yeah. like to have that level of confidence and to pull it off is i think a level of you know like obviously she's remembered as one of the greatest sort of uh soul and gospel singers of all time but to step into mm-hmm. another genre of music entirely and perform it yeah, exactly. like one of the most iconic songs in opera who's like and the sort of definitive rendition of it is pavarotti i guess like that was his you know, like, like it wouldn't work yeah, the other way around. Like, Pavarotti, like Aretha Franklin couldn't have like pulled out, and they go to Pavarotti. Can you just sing "Respect" in yeah. in twenty <laughs> minutes? Like, even if he knows the song, he's not gonna step into the shoes of like the queen of of soul. <laughs> you don't and, know that. <laughs> no, and and part of me now does want to see Pavarotti <laughs> try, try "Respect." <laughs> R E S P E C T. <laughs> oh man, that does sound like yeah. Just you know, sort of on that trying to do something in a language you may or may not understand. I think it was Ron Perlman had a you know a Hellboy and yeah. amongst other things. I'm sure I sure saw something about him. I think it was him, but I'm not gonna. 100% say it was him but it was like he was playing like a Russian like a French person in Russia or something like that like was his character so and it was in Russian but so he had to do Russian with a French accent so he just learned everything phonetically and then yeah. just acted that way because it was just like you know how do you put a French accent it's like right you need to do a language that you don't speak but as if you were naturally spoke a language that you also don't speak. <laughs> yeah, like... Now <laughs> like, uh, get on with it. Because that's it, like, without deep character work of, like, learning French and then mm. being so fluent in that that you could get a, a French person to teach you Russian. Mm-hmm. Then, yeah, you've just got to learn it phonetically and sort of there's no room for yeah. improv, I guess. Yeah. Um, have you about to step in last minute and... And fill a, sp- fill a spot. Obviously, nothing as glamorous as the, uh, the, I was the say, Grammys. Low, lower absolutely stakes. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> absolutely nothing on those sort of stakes. Not even like uh, oh. in sports, like a position you don't normally play. Got to probably. I don't know. <laughs> Not that I can like. I mean, it's one of those things I played for however many years. I mean, I'm pretty sure I did have to go on sometimes and just be like, "What am I doing? Oh, just run here." In fact, actually, yeah, no, I did do that actually. Um, I suppose the sporting equivalent it would be. I know some super important final, and your quarterback yeah. gets injured, and you've got to fill in as quarterback. You know, it's sort of star role. Yeah, well, I don't have anything quite that dramatic, but like I did used to play 
football. That's football as opposed to football. Yeah, exactly. American football. And I played on uh, as a defender. And then the running back got injured and they needed a running back to go in. So I was like, and all the running backs were injured, whatever. So I went on. And, you know, they said the play and, you know, it's like, switch right 27 zebra or something. Well, you know, yeah. Whatever. And I was just like, I don't know what that is. But, <laughs> and I was like, where do I stand? And they went, you stand here. I was like, all right, yeah, I got that. And they're like, and then you're getting the ball. I was like, what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Excuse me, what? <laughs> so r- run that way. Don't get hit. Catch the ball. If you do, carry on running. Yeah, well, it's just like, so- what do you mean I'm getting the ball? <laughs> what, why, why am I getting the ball? Why are you trusting me with this? How about you? Have you ever been roped into anything? Not last minute. Like a lot of the a lot of the sort of sort of public speaking things that I've done have been awful, but I've had a lot of build up to be even less awful. I'm trying to think of anything. No, I'm I'm not a very last minute person to be honest. I like to have something mm-hmm. to panic about. Exactly. I'm much day, the same. Day, days in advance. Really really get some knots of anxiety into that whole thing and really mull it over. I'm not exactly mm-hmm. spontaneous. I don't know. I have a weird thing about spontaneity. I kind of want it, but then I'm always like, I like to plan things too much. So I'm like, no. Yeah, like plan spontaneity. But I like, like to plan some, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so like, uh, you go, you, you know, go for a night out and there are four locations, three of which you know beforehand, and at some point a fourth random location will be sprung on you. That I'm okay with, mm-hmm. but I'm not like the person you call at 10pm being like, do you want to go to this place? And I'm like... No, oh, I need no. to work up to leaving the house. Thank you very much. Well, it's like surprise parties would be my absolute nightmare because yeah, like, awful. <laughs> yeah, if I, if I've got in my head that I'm having a nice planned evening on my own, and then I turned up and there were a bunch of people, <laughs> I'd, I'd, get the I'd fuck like, out of my house. <laughs> yeah, I'd be like, <laughs> yeah, I'd just be like, what <laughs> the fuck are you doing? <laughs> no, no, leave the cake. I had I had very big plans. I hate it when people are like, oh, can you come out? You know, like when people. <laughs> Like, being on your own and chilling is a legitimate plan. Hey, when you're like, people are like, oh, yeah, do I do this? And you're like, no, there is. Like, oh, yeah, you're busy. Like, no? Yeah. Well, I, well like, you're, busy, you're busy doing nothing, you know. Yeah, it's like, I have plans on, you know, tonight. What are they? Just doing fuck all. Yeah. You know, like, what, what, what'd you get up to, plan. What, what'd you get up to this weekend? Oh, nothing much. Just sort of went to the gym, but then you just hung around, watch a bit of telly, you know, watch the film. They're like, oh, right, it's a boring one. I'm like, no, that's what I intended yeah, I to do. I executed yeah. the plan flawlessly. I exactly. didn't say a word to another human being. It was great. So on that note, I think I'll hand mm-hmm. it back over to you for your second topic. Okay, so for my second topic, um, I'm going to talk to you about something we are wildly unqualified to talk about, which is Judaism. Okay, yeah, unlike every other topic we talk about, but yes. Specifically, I want to talk about Ethiopian Jews, also known as Beta Israel. And the reason I bring them up is because, right, so if I said to you, Ethiopian Jews, like, I don't know, like, I assume you'd think the same type of things I thought, which is just Jewish people who happen to be Ethiopian. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Like, you've got British Jews, Polish Jews, American Jews, you know, like it, Ethiopian yeah. Jews, it just sounds yeah. like. You've got Ethiopian Christians, you've got Ethiopian Muslims, Ethiopian Jews, like it makes sense. Mm-hmm. But like, and I didn't realise this, and it sounds like you didn't either, and I really hope that like, I listen, like, it's one of those things where I'm, I really hope it's not common knowledge and that I'm just like, by like, guys, did you know this? But like, Ethiopian Jews come from a completely different set of Judaism to pretty much the rest of like the Jewish community and they were essentially like lost contact and then we you know like then thousands of years later came back into contact and they didn't have like thousands of years of like basically isolation but keeping their old practices and then people realized then so they had even had a debate like the um you know the uh what's it called like Jewish council ever the uh you know the ones in uh Israel to basically mm-hmm. decide whether or not they counted as Jews, and then they decided that they did, and gave them that um, they had the law of return. Right. So, because a thousand years ago they were practicing Judaism, I, then 
and that 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 line's gone unbroken. Yeah. Then even if they're they're practicing uh, an older version of it or yeah. older customs, well, it's still an unbroken line of. Yeah, and that's exactly yeah. it. So essentially, what happened was, I'm guessing, because um, there's not a lot of it's like there's not actually that much like what do you call it like sort of written history. Yeah. Yeah, so what happened was, way back when, I guess a load of, um, you know, like the way people did, people travelled around and Ethiopia's, you know, sort of northeast Africa, so it's not that, in world global scale, not that far away yeah. from Israel. Um, so Jewish people would have moved down there and settled there. And then over time, sort of lost contact and stuff. and And then, you know, over time... Islam came into the area and Christianity, but then this like it's like a group, like a small area of Ethiopia kept the Jewish traditions. But what they were is they basically missed a load of the reforms that happened in the meantime. So apparently they like don't have rabbis, I think. But essentially, like you say, they've got the and this is what I mean, I'm wildly unqualified to talk about this, so in terms of like terminology and stuff, I'm not there. But apparently it aligns perfectly with the rituals from the time of the second temple. So essentially, whenever that was, which I think is a thousand, couple of thousand years ago, those are all the traditions they've kept. And so modern Judaism has different rituals and different things, but it's essentially all the same starting point. It wasn't until the 20th century that they came into contact with other Jewish, you know, with the mainstream Jewish community. And then that's when it all, it wasn't until 1977 that they they had a discussion and they, you know, they all agreed that, yes, this is a branch of Judaism. How did they manage to stay sort of isolated enough to not have the sort of advancements in religious practice sort of filter in? Just, just a secluded part of the world? Yeah, or? and also they apparently like, um, like I read somewhere that they have... Like, basically, to sort of withstand influence of, like, Christian, um, what do you call them? You, what do you, what's the word? You know when um, missionaries, that's the one, you know, when they go mm-hmm. around the world, stuff like that, and to, like, make sure they strengthened it. They had, um, like, monasteries, monks, which you don't really get in the rest of Judaism, apparently, but then, like, basically, they put these whole, like, religious orders together to sort of, you know, strengthen their own beliefs and community or whatever against like outside influence so they had to come up with their own practices to sort of are they still primarily in ethiopia or have many of them now returned to israel they're both i think there's still some in ethiopia but then yeah they were given the right to move to israel um you know it's the whole yeah it's that thing isn't it like if you're jewish you've got the it's you can claim israeli citizenship can't you and and have you got a sort of approximate numbers like how many people were? Um, there was apparently a hundred and twenty-ish thousand people in Israel. You know, when all these religions started, there was very little literacy and stuff. Mm. So it does make you wonder how many like other tribes were sort of of various religions or various cultures were sort of lost. But you know, and like how many others practiced in isolation and how long for before they sort of reintegrated and stuff like that yeah because what's interesting to me is there are obviously religious communities around the world from lots of different faiths and doctrines that they're not unaware of reformations or changes Mm. they just actively refuse them and they just practice a older and Mm. i don't want to say purer but you know a sort of more you know closer to origin form of that faith but that but they're still aware of it Mm -hmm. you know it's not like just being cut off to the point where they weren't aware of these reformations happening. Yeah. One thing I do know about Ethiopia is one of the sort of like more powerful African kingdoms, you know, and it, you know, famously like wasn't colonised. I think it briefly Mm -hmm. was by Italy, like right near the end of sort of colonisation type thing. And even then I think it ended up not going well for Italy. (laughs) But, you know, so they basically were one of the more powerful states. So, you know, maybe that meant that, and again, this is speculation on my part, so don't take it, but, you know, whether or not being somewhere that didn't rely on, you know, oh, sorry, wasn't forced into being part of another country's sort of trade routes and stuff might have 
led to more isolation than that. If they'd been colonialised to a bigger extent, obviously the threat of Christianity would be greater mm. or Islam or whatever, so yeah. There could have been times where the, we know about it because it only happened recently, and so we're like, oh yeah, they've been isolated. But you know, like, if it, you could still have, you know, for example, a bunch of early Christians go off to somewhere that, you know, go off to say, to the east or somewhere, mm. and then essentially they could be isolate, could have been isolated for generations and then, you know, even a thousand years ago, but they could have spent a thousand years sort of in isolation before being brought back into the sort of wider community again. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. there's I mean, lots yeah, of like... The, the, only, the only sort of parallel I can think is maybe some parts of Russia that have a very like, unique Russian orthodoxy. I do. Again, speculation. Oh, but I'm, but I, I'd imagine there aren't many places I can think of that be so isolated and yeah. i guess russia would be one of the few of them and also imagine if you were one of them if you were ethiopian if you were in that community and then finding out you know if you think that you're the only group in the world that does this particular thing and then like one day you're like holy shit there's loads of us <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah you know what i mean like imagine that like it would change everything wouldn't it imagine thinking like you know like say the amish you know, as far as I know, they're like pretty small communities, pretty much all grouped around like Pennsylvania. And then imagine if they found out one day, thinking that you know this small patch of Pennsylvania was the only like Amish community, and then one day finding out that like all of Africa was Amish, <laughs> and they'd be like, <laughs> "Holy fuck!" Like, <laughs> like it would change everything. You know, you go from being like send them an email <laughs> yeah, or what. But let's say the main thing that gets me is just the fact that like obviously somebody had like recognized their like beliefs and stuff and we're like hang on a second this is all very similar but not quite the same as judaism and then they would have like dug into it and then been like holy shit this is exactly like judaism used to be yeah it's sort of proto judaism yeah they've got and obviously the language has evolved and changed and stuff so like they've got different terminology for things but they're like referring to the same thing like apparently one of the things was like how they had the same sabbath day and stuff like that and they observed the Sabbath and, you know, like, no work for, like, sundown to sundown, isn't it? Yeah, over the, sa- yeah. Over the Sabbath. So, yeah, anyway, that's my tale of something I don't know much about. For a change. Okay, so that's my second topic. Over to you, Chris, to round us out. Okay, I'll ask you for my second topic. Chris, what objectively is the best food? I mean, I'm a big fan of the burger. The answer we were looking for was fried chicken. Oh. Nah. I mean, I like fried chicken, but nah, it's not my it's not my go to. Like all things equal, I'd go for like a big old juicy burger. No, I, I, I googled objectively, oh, okay. and it is it is fried oh, chicken. Okay, may, uh, <laughs> yeah, nothing you can do about it. <laughs> um, maybe maybe a, a fair answer is what is the one thing you associate with fried chicken? The kernel. Not the answer I've got, but like I'll I'll take that. Go on. But the thing uh, KFC want to associate, or want you to associate with their chicken, is greasy Polaroids. In 2015, KFC brought out a a limited edition bucket of chicken Mm. that doubled up as a printer. What? Like how? So, like a printer's like a pretty like substantial piece of like electronic equipment, <laughs> and a bucket is normally just a piece of cheap cardboard. Yeah, it was right. So you got your regular um, car- cardboard uh, bucket, yeah. and that's the top bit. And then obviously the, at the bottom is <laughs> it's just an entire um, printer. <laughs> That's not, uh, that doesn't double up. It's just a printer <laughs> with a bucket stapled on top. It's all one unit. So, like the the sh- the bottom the bottom of the bucket underneath that is a is a Bluetooth printer. <laughs> you take photos on your smartphone, and then via Bluetooth you can print them from your bucket. <laughs> Why a KFC family bucket is like say it's about a tenner. It's gonna say ten quid. And that's probably like the most expensive bucket they do. <laughs> like a Bluetooth printer is like thirty quid. Like, there's no way this makes any financial sense. They sold it for eighty nine dollars. Why? <laughs> because you know when you just tuck in through like a lot of greasy fried chicken, just grease smeared over your face. Mm. That the the only thing that makes it better is showing those bloated memories. <laughs> 
with friends slash on your own because you know let's be honest i'm buying a bargain bucket for myself i remember the time me and you went to um i think i think we'd had a half day at school or something for some reason we were in the mood to celebrate and we went straight to kfc <laughs> after school and we went and yep. ordered the family giant bucket and like there's an actual family in front of us who'd ordered the exact same thing and they asked them how many like plates and cutlery they, sets of cutlery they needed and they were like six or something and then they said to like, what about you and we're like two me and him just gonna in a you know in our school uniform just gonna plop this giant bucket of chicken down and tuck through it and imagine you know we both re- fondly remember that that day <laughs> imagine how much more cemented in our memories it would be if like you know covered in grease and chips and bacon uh, not bacon uh, uh, chicken batter we could have just put you know done a, a quick greasy selfie and printed it straight from the bucket if only if only if only it's a it's a good Wait, idea can, is this in america they're selling this what's all this uh this was in uh, this was in canada it was to celebrate the uh, so this was the memories bucket as they called it and it was released to celebrate um kfc's uh kfc canada's 60th anniversary lucky canada i guess grease from chicken is going to soak through everything you're, re- you're really you're not... really focused on the grease <laughs> look don't get me wrong it is delicious but like the idea of uh, keeping electrical equipment near hot fried chicken yeah. just seems stupid to me yeah well the whole concept i mean how many i don't know if you have this but how many did they sell like was it a success or did a load of people go i'm not spending 90 dollars on the printer and chicken printer it was a it, it's called the memories bucket please at least honor it with its official name i think because it was a limited edition it wasn't something that they rolled out nationwide or with ever the intention of people being like oh this is my new staple it was a limited edition thing so i think they made a few hundred of them and people got them because it's a limited edition thing rather than something that was necessary. I feel like that's a nice way of saying we didn't sell that many, but we never thought we would. They made a few and people bought them. Mm. I had a look on eBay to see if if any were still around but couldn't find any, because I think the grease, which I will return to (laughs) once again, might might have made them deteriorate. There's a long line of of KFC sort of novelty limited edition items. They made, you know, like when you go, you get your tray and then there's like a paper paper tray liner a to keep the grease off it but b also just to advertise to you while you're in the like you've already got your food but you still need to be advertised yeah. to uh they did, did a limited edition um paper tray liner that doubled as a bluetooth keyboard it was literally just like a standard keyboard layout but on paper wow. uh they did edible coffee cups that apparently tasted like cookies oh, that sounds nice as long as it doesn't like disintegrate whilst you've still got coffee in it yeah it's like the soup in the bowl thing you know where the, you get like a hollowed out sort of a loaf helmet yeah. of bread that yeah and they pour soup in. i went somewhere i think it was called hummus bros and it was the same concept like i mean you had like a bowl right so yeah so don't get me wrong like i'm not saying the bowl was made out of hummus there was like a, a porcelain bowl then it was filled mm-hmm. with hummus then the hummus itself had a dip in, and then that was filled with, like, stew or something. Britain, KFC, comes with fries, and everyone, like, universally agrees they're, like, the worst fries, but, like, it comes with fries. Mm-hmm. Apparently in America, mashed potato. Oh. I mean, I'm sure some Americans might contradict this, but now we go with fries, but no. I was ripped. I was informed on Twitter that, um, yeah, no, <laughs> but it's weird that they find it weird that we have it with fries because to them it's a mashed potato like place. I mean, I guess because it's more like it's like what do they call it like soul food, like comfort <clears throat> food is like chicken and mashed potatoes and grits and what's weird is the is doing chicken and waffles. I don't know what grits me. are. I, I, me neither. Okay. But I, I've heard them said about the also South biscuits and, and gravy just... means something yeah, it's entirely just... different. Like biscuits, <laughs> yeah don't have anything to do with our biscuits and the gravy looks nothing no. like our gravy like yeah like biscuits to us is what they call cookies mm-hmm. but a cookie is a kind of yeah. biscuit like a cookie is a subset of biscuit but a, yeah rather than a biscuit being a soft like it's like a scone without dried yeah, fruit sort I of thing it's, it's odd like i'm sure it's nice but i can't go there's already a name, name. <laughs> call it something else call it a dumpling yeah 
It's closer to a dumpling than it is a biscuit. Yeah. As a, as a side note, there's a guy that goes... Well, he doesn't go to my gym, but he goes to the gym changing rooms. Ooh, and he... Uh, right, okay, because, so... Because, you know, at the moment, you're just describing a pervert. <laughs> like, he doesn't actually use the gym, he just hangs well, out in the changing rooms. It gets worse. He lays down a towel mm-hmm. on the uh, on the bench, gets completely undressed tucked through a bucket of fried chicken. Most of the time, it's the Colonel's finest. Sometimes it's a it's a lesser brand. Um, and reads the paper. Why? Because he's a man who is free. Wow. It's weird to be so disgusted by someone's behaviour, but then to finish a workout and be like, oh, I could really go <laughs> for some fried chicken right now. Because it just stinks up the whole changing room. What? And I sort of want to talk to him and to say like, Why? What what has happened in your life that's led you to like because because here's my theory that the the nakedness is clearly part of it otherwise he would sit in KFC and eat mm-hmm. it right like he could just sit fully clothed in a booth and eat a load of fried chicken and read the paper yeah. right so so the, the the nudity is clearly a key element of what he likes to spend his afternoons doing why not do that at home so that leads me to the conclusion that it has to be a public thing mm-hmm. and the gym changing room. It's the only place he can be naked in public and eat by chicken. Wow. What a weird tale. And so that brings us deliciously to the end of episode 45 of Cooking with Grief. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you're doing okay out there if you're still in lockdown, depending on what country you were living. But we hope you're staying safe, staying warm or cool, depending on the weather. Just a, 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 just staying in a nice temperature. <laughs> yeah, just staying ambient. Just classic, lukewarm, if not cooler. I've been Chris. I've been joined by a fellow Chris. That's me. Who will say bye now. Bye. Told you. If you want to follow us on Twitter for updates, jokes, sideways glances about the news, personal questions answered, you can follow us on uh, at Cooking With Grief. Or if you want to email us suggestions for topics or longer messages about feedback for the show, then you can uh, email uh, cookingwithgrief at gmail.com. This has been a Big Heads Media production, and you will hear an advert for one of our fellow Big Headers after the outro has inevitably wrapped up, so all it leaves is for us to say goodbye. Goodbye, which I what you said, but I'm saying it again. I, I think the second time was better. The second take okay. was, was pretty good. We'll use that one. Okay. All right. Goodbye. Bye. See, now we've done the third take. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, we've got to give the uh, editor some ammo. No, I want less ammo. (laughs) (laughs) I want one take. Do it again. We're feeling. I'm Midnight Agent Raw. And I'm Okami. We are the Super Media Bros Podcast. Each week, we give a comedically informative take on movies, music, television, video games, and much more. Put your shades on and listen to all episodes on SuperMediaBrosPodcast.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Yeah, shades on, we're off.